For the last few weeks, I've been working on making my 3D printer do this. Not only that, but I've also developed a method to transcribe music as complex as this into G-code, which is specific to your 3D printer. Today I introduce to you 3 Melody. We all know and love 3D printers. They turn long strings of plastic into things like prototypes, toy rockets, even real rockets. What? But sometimes amazing technology is used in ways that are unforeseen, oh God, bro. Oh, unanticipated, hell, bro, if you will. Bro. So there I was studying for a big upcoming exam when I got this itch to misuse technology. I was sitting there watching my printer do its thing, and I noticed that sometimes when it moved in a certain way, it sounded as if it were playing certain notes. In that moment, I decided that my printer was no longer a tool, but an instrument. By the way, if you're like me and you use your printer for anything but 3D printing, check out this video's sponsor, PCBWay. Their 3D manufacturing services can provide you with any part and almost any type of material, while you and your printer tend to more important things. In my previous video on linear rails, I used PCBWay's 3D printing and aluminum CNC machining services. All the parts I received were fantastic and exactly to spec, so if you need something like aluminum parts or exotic resin parts, check out PCBWay. Thanks again to PCBWay for sponsoring this video, and now let's get back to talking about music. So before we even consider the possibility of our 3D printer being able to make music, we kind of have to break down what is music. Music is a collection of noises played in some sort of pattern. These noises we call notes. Notes define the pitch of our sound, how high or low they sound. The pattern that assembles our noises into beautiful musical compositions is called rhythm. So I guess the first logical step is to figure out how to play notes on the printer. From what I'd already observed, I realized that when the printer moved at certain speeds, I would hear certain notes. So what I did was sit next to my printer with a guitar and I would play certain notes and tweak the speeds that the printer would move at until I found two sounds that match. Changing the speed of the printer is kind of like tuning a string on a guitar. Lower speed, higher speed. Once I found the speed that played a certain note, I would write it down and move to the next one. After defining a bunch of notes necessary for one song, I did a whole bunch of monotonous calculations and ended up with this. Now don't get me wrong, this felt really good. But I had just spent hours doing tons of monotonous math, and I'd only gotten through a few measures of a song. I knew there had to be a better way. So again, I asked myself, how do we play a note on the printer? I know that when we move a certain speed on our axes that a certain note is heard, but what's going on behind the scenes? Why is that certain speed playing a certain note? Well, a note's pitch is defined by its frequency. Frequency is the amount of times that something occurs in a given amount of time. For example, I brush my teeth twice a day. Abstractly put, an event occurs two times in the time interval of one day. Another example would be the tachometer in a car. The tachometer in your car tells you how many revolutions per minute that your engine shaft is rotating in your car. When we talk about sound though, we use a unit called hertz, also known as one over second or per second. With sound, the thing occurring per second is the number of sound waves. What these really are are compression waves. And an easy way to think about this to get a better understanding is to think of a speaker. Basically, when that woofer moves back and forth, we get these compression waves. Or basically, you can see this area of high density of particles in the air. And in between, you'll have a lower density. And basically, these pressure waves are what we're representing when we show 
the sound wave. You can see that the peaks correlate to the densest areas of the compression waves. So we should just be able to do something a bunch of times per second on our printer, and it will make these compression waves at that frequency. Easy enough, let's give it a try. Okay, well we can't actually just do something a bunch of times per second. The actual solution lies here, in the stepper motors. Our stepper motors can rotate quite fast. Not hundreds of times per second fast, but quite fast. But they can do something else very quickly. Step. If you're not familiar, stepper motors turn by turning on and off magnetic coils, which slowly step these two offset gears. One of these movements is called a step. So, now we just need to figure out how to make our stepper motors go a defined amount of steps per second. Now the number we're going to shoot for first is 440 steps per second. Don't worry about why for now, but we're going for 440. So let's get started. What do we already know? Well, we just covered that stepper motor shafts turn a certain amount of degrees per step. The two most common degrees per step that we see in 3D printing is 3.6 degrees and 1.8 degrees. Also we know, because circles, that a circle is comprised of 360 total degrees. 360 degrees divided by 3.6 degrees per step is going to give us 100 steps. And you can see that for the 1.8 degree stepper motor, that would give us 200 steps. And that is the amount of steps it takes for one full revolution. So with 3.6 degrees per step being the more common configuration in 3D printing, that is the configuration I'm going to assume for the remainder of the video. So we now know that one revolution is equal to 100 steps. So if we want to go 440 steps per second, and we know it's 100 steps per revolution, then we can quickly find that 440 divided by 100 steps per revolution is going to give us 4.4 revolutions per second. So we now know that our stepper motor needs to rotate 4.4 times per second to give us 440 steps per second. Now that's great and all, but there's no g-code command that tells our printer to rotate one of its axes 4.4 times per second. Instead, our g-code commands are move from this point to this point at this speed. So instead of defining things in revolutions per second, we need to figure out how fast it has to travel in a linear distance per second. Luckily, this is fairly straightforward. Now, if you've worked with Clipper before, then you should be familiar with distance traveled per revolution. This is something that we have in our configuration file to tell Clipper how far our axes travel for one full revolution of our stepper motor. For instance, my x-axis travels at 40 millimeters per revolution, my y-axis travels at 32 millimeters per revolution, and my z-axis travels at 8 millimeters per revolution. The reason that these values are different isn't because the stepper motors are different. They're actually the same in my case. The reasoning is that the gear pulleys that drive our axes are not the same. For instance, my x-axis one is going to be larger, and my y-axis one is going to be smaller. And this is because the x-axis is a lot lighter, so we can, get, we can take advantage of that larger radii of the gear. So if you think about the circumference of our circle, that red line is going to be a lot longer than that red line. So now we know that when my x-axis revolves one time, that our x-axis is gonna travel 40 millimeters linearly. So if we now go back to that 4.4 revolutions per second that we wanna do, and we know that our axis moves 40 millimeters per revolution, we now can multiply these together, and we find that we need to move at 176 millimeters per second. If you've kept up this far, then you should be able to see now that 440 steps per second is going to be equivalent to 176 millimeters per second. And that's for the x-axis. So if I want to play a note at 440 hertz, then I know that I need to move 176 millimeters per second. But again, I don't just tell my printer how fast to move, I also have to tell it how far to move. So I'm going to assume that we want to play our note for a time of one second. So if we multiply the time to our velocity, then we know that we need to move 176 millimeters at 176 
millimeters per second. The last thing we need to do is convert our speed to the feed rate of a G-code command. For some reason, G-code is in millimeters per minute, not in millimeters per second. So we just need to multiply our number 176 times 60. So using this information, if we assume that our printer is going to start at x equals zero, so in about the home position, this should be our g-code. So this just tells our printer to move from its current position, x equals zero, to the point 176 at a feed rate of 10,560 millimeters per minute. So let's quickly check and see if an A4 on the guitar sounds like an A4 on the printer. It should sound like this. Okay, that's cool. We can play a single note. But music is made up of lots of different notes. How are we going to get all those other notes? Well, we just need to know the frequency of all the other notes. If we know the frequency of the note, we can find out the travel speed that results in the creation of that note. Now, at first glance, that seems like a ton of work. This is where that 440 hertz comes in. When we play a note at 440 hertz, that's referred to as A4. In music's standard tuning system, A4 is referred to as the reference frequency. It's called the reference frequency because all of the other notes we can play are defined relative to that A4 note. But how are they related to each other? Let's figure that out. This is A5. It's the same exact note played an octave higher. You can probably hear they sound like the same note as opposed to any other note. Now, when I say something is an octave higher or an octave lower, this means that the frequency that that octave higher note is played at is twice the frequency of our reference note. So A4 is 440 hertz, and A5 is 880 hertz. On the other hand, if we go down an octave, we divide our frequency by two. So if we have A4 at 440 hertz, then we have A3 at 220 hertz. This octave relationship is kind of a natural miracle of music, so we just have to take it as fact. So this is the equation that defines our frequencies that are an octave up or an octave below or however many octaves in whatever direction you wanna go. So we assume that our reference frequency is equal to 440 hertz, which is again a four. So if we want to go an octave up, then I will say that n is equal to one. If we plug these into our equation, we get that 440 hertz times two raised to the one is equal to 880 hertz. And that is indeed the frequency, which is for the note A5. If we want to go down an octave, then we know that N is equal to negative one. If N is equal to negative one, then we again plug that into our octave equation, we get 440 hertz times two raised to the negative one power, which does indeed give us 220 hertz, the frequency of the note called A3. So that's great and all, now we know how to find the frequencies for all of the A notes, but how do we find the frequency for the notes in between them? If we start at A4 and we play up until the next A, A5, we count 12 notes. Uh, uh, uh. So there are 11 notes in between the two A's and we play 12 separate notes to get up to there. Now your first instinct might be to divide up all of the frequencies between 440 hertz and 880 hertz. So let's go ahead and do that on the printer and see what that sounds like. As your ears probably told you, that didn't sound quite right. This is what it should sound like. So the reason that doesn't sound quite right is because remember, with our octave notes, we defined a base to relationship. Basically, if we look at this on a graph, we say that this is 220, 440, 660, and 880. We know that our note started here, and then it went here, and then it was all the way up here. So we can see that this is something that resembles an exponential relationship. But what we've done is instead of interpolating at this exponential curve, we have instead done a linear interpolation which if you extrapolate past any of these notes is going to be very wrong. And you can see that depending on where 
you extrapolate from, you're going to get very different notes. So instead of interpolating and extrapolating linearly, we need to use this base two relationship. So let's again take a look at our octave equation. We again have our frequency is equal to our reference frequency times two raised to the n. Now, this is where we're going to divide up our frequencies into 12 separate notes to get from our A4 to our A5. Instead of n just being one, why don't we make it fractional so that we can basically divide that octave up into 12 separate segments. So what we're going to do is divide n by 12. If our F ref is equal to A4, then A5 is the frequency that we'll get when we input n equals 12. So if we put in n equals 12, we get 2 raised to the 12 over 12, which is 2 raised to the 1, which is just going to multiply our frequency by 2 and still retain that octave relationship. And it'll work with negative 12 as well. But now we've unlocked the ability to get all of our other notes. So let's put in n equals 2, which should give us b4, which last time we said was about 520 hertz based on the linear interpolation, which we know is wrong. So if we do n equals 12, then we get 2 raised to the 1 over 6 times 440 is equal to approximately 494 hertz. So it looks like our original guess was off by almost 30 hertz, which is in this range, not negligible. So let's go ahead and use this relationship to solve for n equals 1 through 12 so that we can fill out all the rest of the notes that we need. Let's go ahead and see how that sounds on the printer. That sounds great. So now we should be able to extrapolate from this equation to all the other notes and theoretically play any note we want on our printer. But remember, music isn't just notes, but also rhythm. <laughs> So let's take a quick look at rhythms. Just as we had a 440 hertz reference note, we also have references for rhythms. Typically there are two numbers out in front of the beginning of our song, and we have this other number. So this top number basically tells us that we have four quarter notes per measure, which isn't really important for us, but this bottom note is telling us that our quarter note is what is played in a total of one beat. So if you feel music and you feel that beat, each one of those is going to be a quarter note. And we know that there will be four of those per measure. We then have this third number up top, which tells us that a quarter note is played 60 times per minute. So I conveniently chose this so that we would have a quarter note per second. So if we had music made of just quarter notes, we would have something like this. And that first measure would take four seconds to play because we play 60 quarter notes per minute. So it would take four seconds to play four quarter notes. A quarter note looks something like that. Next, we have something called an eighth note. And I'm not going to go through every single rhythm possible that would take way too long and it doesn't matter, but I'm just going through a few of the basic ones so you have an understanding. Basically, an eighth note is half the value of a quarter note. So a single quarter note is equal to two eighth notes. Next, we have and maybe you guessed it, a 16th note. And you may have guessed it again, but a quarter note is equal to four 16th notes. Eighth note is equal to two 16th notes. So in this way, if we're at 60 beats per minute, we know that a quarter note is equal to one second, an eighth note is equal to half a second, and a 16th note is equal to 0 0.25 seconds. So real quickly, let's figure out how we would translate this into G-code. So remember that to play an A4, we need to move at 176 millimeters per second, which we know if we're at 60 beats per minute, because we have 60 corner notes per minute, we know that we would need to move one second to play a quarter note. So again, that would give us 176 millimeter movement at 176 millimeters per second. And that is equal to a quarter note. Now, what if we want to do an eighth note? 
we still want to move at 176 millimeters per second because that defines the pitch of our note, which we don't want to change. So instead, we know we need to move half the distance because we want to take half the time. So instead, we will move 88 millimeters at 176 millimeters per second to get an eighth note. And finally, you may have guessed it already, but we would move 44 millimeters at 176 millimeters per second to get a 16th note. And basically that's how we're going to create different rhythms with our G codes. So taking everything we've gone over so far into consideration, let's try and make our first song. The one I chose to do is C Shanty 2. Let's see how it works. <laughs> Nice! I can now sleep at night knowing that I can play music on my 3D printer. See ya! Sheesh. Long day. What if we want to play multiple notes at once? Currently, the printer can do this. But what if we wanted to do this? So as I worked on the previous sections, I started to realize that the method I was using was going to make playing multiple notes at a time a problem. The issue is that we don't have a G-code command that can tell our separate axes to move at different speeds. And it's not like we can send a couple different G-code commands and have them all be done at once. Now, this is because our printers can only read one line of G-code at a time. Basically, we send them a bunch of G-codes, they read one, they execute it, and it disappears, and then we move on to the next line. And then we read that one and it disappears, and we move on to the next line. We can't give it three different commands that tell three different axes to move in three different ways. So we need to find a clever way around that. And it's actually been in front of us this whole time. When we issue a move command, we are telling our printer to move at three different axes all at the same time, but we're not defining a speed for every single axis. So how is it that our axes are all moving at different speeds? And what is the speed rate actually defining? It's pretty clear when we only have an X, a Y, or a Z, but when we have two or three axes moving at once, what is that feed rate now defining? So to understand why that is, we need to quickly talk about vectors. Vectors are wonderful quantities that describe objects requiring more than one number to be defined. Imagine you ask someone for directions to the closest store, and they tell you to go 10 miles. Okay, what does that mean? 10 miles which direction? So that is a vector. A vector, in this case, has a magnitude that we will call the length or the distance, and we've now requested that second quantity, which is equal to the direction. Say that the person tells us that we need to travel in a east by northeast direction. If we were to draw this on some sort of map, and we're starting down here, we might get something that looks like this. So we know that we have a distance of 10 miles, and we have some direction relative to the direction east. We now have a vector. Now imagine that we want to get from the start point of this vector, where we are currently located, to the store, which is located over here. We know that there's a 10 mile distance, so we would just need to travel at 10 miles per hour. But imagine this is a city and there's all these different blocks and stores and buildings in the way. What if now we need to move in a square grid-like fashion? We can quickly see that we need to travel east and then north. Now, if instead of east and north, we define east as the x direction and north as the y direction, then we can see that we've broken down our vector into two more simple vectors, known as the components of our vector. This is kind of what our g-code command is saying. It's like saying, hey, move from this point to this x point and move from this y point to this y point, both at the same time. 
but it wants us to do it at a speed based on this distance, or our resultant vector is what that main vector is called. So let's quickly work through an example to see how this applies to our printer. Say that we start here, and we want our printer to move over 2x equals 40, and we want the y-axis to move up to y equals 30. So if we draw the resultant vector that starts from our start point and ends at our end point, we can quickly find the length of that because we know that to get the length of that vector, we need to add its components in quadrature. And I know that sounds kind of confusing, but this is basically just Pythagorean's theorem. If that's our a, our b, and our c, then we know that c is equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared. And in this case, 40 and 30 I chose because it comes out to a clean 50. So if we want our x move, to take one second, and we want our y move to take one second, then we would also want our resultant vector to take one second. And knowing that our resultant vector is the value of 50, then we know that we would want to move at 50 per second. Now this is truly brilliant, this is so cool. So let's say that we want to play an A4 on our x-axis, and we want to play an A3 on our y-axis, and we want to play an A2 on the z-axis. So if we want all of that to take one second, we would want to move 176 millimeters on the x-axis, 70.4 millimeters along the y-axis, and 8.8 .8 millimeters along the z-axis. Now it's a little harder to wrap your head around because this is 3D space, not 2D space, but basically we're still using Pythagorean's theorem. We're just adding all these distances up in quadrature to get that resultant vector length. So if we take the square root of all of these numbers squared, the resultant length comes out to be about 189.76 millimeters. So if we want to complete this move in one second, we know that we would want to move 189.76 millimeters per second. But again, we need to multiply that by 60, which gives us 11,385.72 millimeters per minute. And that is our feed rate that goes into our G-code command. So our resulting G-code command should be G1 X 176 Y 70.4 Z 8.8. .8. And remember, this is assuming that we're starting at 0, 0, 0 for our X, Y, and Z. So we're basically homed. And then our feed rate, again, is 11,385.72. So let's go ahead and put this into our printer and see if all three axes play these three notes that we have defined. Oh, that's so great. We can play at least three different notes at the same time. Now we just need to write some G code for our songs. Okay, so now all this ridiculous math is the most time-consuming part of the project. Calculating the speed we need for different notes, calculating how far we have to travel for a certain rhythm in all three axes, adding those axes up to get that full 3D vector move to create G-code. I mean, that's a lot of work for a single note. This took forever for a single line of music, let alone an incredibly complex song. So I decided to write some kind of musical programming language and write a script to translate that into G-code, and this is what we got. Now presenting... This is a script that takes in a musical programming language and spits out G-code. This has gone through a lot of iterations, tweaks, and improvements, and I'd love to go over it, but I don't want to relive that trauma right now. But we'll do a quick overview. If you want a deeper dive into the script, I actually released another video at the same time as this one, which takes a deeper dive into that, so check that out up here. Not only will that video dive deeper into the actual programming, but I'll actually show you how to get it set up on your end 
so that you can generate G-code for your printer. But for now, let's look at it from 10,000 feet down. So I had three axes on my printer that could play notes, so I decided to split these up into three different things. The melody, the mids, and the bass. The x-axis plays the melody as it's capable of playing the higher notes. The z-axis is the slower of all three axes, so it plays the lowest notes, or the bass. The y-axis just kind of fills in whenever the melody needs some harmony or the bass needs some harmony, because it can kind of play that mid-range, so it does whatever I feel like it should. So, the simplest way I could think of creating this musical programming language was to break down these things into three different files. The melody, the mid, and the bass. This is what the inside of one of those files looks like. Now don't be intimidated, these are a lot simpler than they seem. Basically, each line of this text file represents a 16th note. The notes are typed in using their official names, such as A4 or B flat 5, and these files are set up in such a way that depending on how you type in these notes, you can create different rhythms, like a quarter note, a 16th note, or, you know, even a dotted eighth note. The same goes for rests, which are just represented by the letter R. So these three files are fed into the script simultaneously, and it goes through all three at once, one line at a time, and it generates a G code, which will create those three notes at once. Now getting into how you can have different rhythms on the melody, mid, and bass parts gets into the nitty gritty of the kinematics equations that I set up in the script. So again, if you wanna see that, check that other video out. Now with this musical programming language and this script, I was able to transcribe all of Fur Elise in just a few hours. If you want to see the full Fur Elise video, that's linked as well. So if you have a musical background, you should be able to throw together a snippet from a song within less than an hour. But if you don't have a musical background, you might be looking at this like it's some impossible task. And maybe it is without some considerable effort. Unfortunately, that's just the reality. Luckily, if someone else with a complete different printer writes a song that you want, they can give you that melody mid and bass file, and then you can run it through the script, and it will generate G-code specific to your printer. So I've uploaded this script and the music files that I've created so far onto a GitHub repository linked down in the description. My hope is that some of you watching this video will create some music files and request that I put them on the GitHub repository so that others can share them. Not only is there a need for more music, but honestly the project needs to be further developed as well. It's got a couple of limitations and some quality of life improvements that could be made. So if you're interested in learning about that and contributing in that way, then again, check out the accompanying video. If you're interested in sharing the music that you've made with this program, or you want to show off a cool project you're working on, I've set up a Discord server for this channel. It's got a few different areas for sharing songs, for sharing 3D prints, cool projects you're working on, mods you've done to your printer, anything like that. Thank you so much for watching. As always, I hope you learned something from this video or something piqued your interest and motivated you to do something. I'm really excited to interact with you all more, and I hope to see some of you in the Discord server soon. If I don't see you there, then I'll make sure to catch you in the next video. So until then, I've been Spencer, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.